Well, let's, um, let's go ahead and read our text this evening, which is the text we were looking at this morning. Remember, this is part two. I'd like to read for you Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 11. This morning we looked at verses 5 through 11. Now we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 5. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Uh, Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes this. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing uh, this evening. And I pray that uh, the Lord will help me not to be distracted by hearing myself speaking through the speakers when I'm not speaking. (laughs) All righty, well again, as I've said, this is part two. This morning we were looking at uh, what our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to do in order to save us. And again, what we saw was Paul telling us in very clear terms that Jesus Christ is fully God. That's what it means that he was uh, in the form, as it were, of God. He existed in the form of God. Remember, we saw that wasn't really past tense. It's something that was true even after the incarnation. He continued to exist in the form of God, which means he had the nature of God, the characteristics and attributes of God. Paul says he was equal with God. And the only one, of course, who can have all of those things is God himself, because God alone has that nature. God alone can be equal with himself. Well, this one, being God, was willing to become a man, uh, to become a servant to each one of us, to, to serve us even to the point of being willing to take upon himself the curse that was due to us for our sins. Remember, Paul talks about the fact that he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. And again, the emphasis there being that everyone who hangs on a tree is considered cursed by God. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ was willing to do for us, to become a curse for us, to take our curse upon himself, to take the wrath of his Father against himself for our sins so that we would be saved. Now, again, that's, that's the example that is given to us of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we know that he did this because it was the only way we could have been saved. And of course, the Father, wanting to display his glory, um, gave to us this great grace and this love. He sent His Son into the world, the Son desiring also to glorify His Father, and because of His love for us, was willing to do this. This is a grand illustration, a grand uh, display of the grace and love of God. He was willing to do that. It was the only way, and His great love made Him willing to do that, again, to do the only thing that could have been done in order to save us. Remember, The one who would save us, the one who would pay this price had to be God and man. And so God came down and became man to do this. So he was willing to do this because it was the only way it could be done and because of his great love. But as we move into this particular 
uh, section of what Paul has to say, we, we don't want to forget that Jesus did it for another reason, and that is to provide an example for us. That's what Paul is pointing to, the example of Jesus Christ. Have this attitude in yourselves that was also in Him. And what is that attitude? What is that example? That we might love the Father even as Jesus loved Him and become a servant to Him to seek to glorify Him in this world. That's what the Lord made us for, was His glory. And that we might also do as our Lord Jesus Christ did in loving others, in loving our neighbor, even as Jesus loved His neighbor and sought to serve them by ministering the gospel to them and especially to His own people in laying down His life for those who would trust in Him. Now, I think as we look to the Scripture, if there's any one thing that the Lord puts a premium on that He calls us to do more than anything else, it is to serve. And we all know that serving isn't always the easiest thing to do, but it is when we're serving that we are most like the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, what is it that Jesus came into the world to do after all? He says in Matthew 20, 28, that He did not come to be served which, of course, he deserved to be, but rather to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. What is it that he calls us to do uh, virtually more than anything else? But it is to serve one another. Even as he said to his disciples in John 15, verses 12 through 13, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. He wants us to lay down our lives for one another even as He laid down His life for us. And that doesn't mean, of course, just be willing to die if, if we need to for one another, but it means to set aside ourselves and our desires and needs in order to serve one another. And who is it that Jesus said would be the one who would be most greatly honored in the kingdom of heaven, but the one who humbles Himself to become the servant of all? That is what our Lord Jesus Christ did. He humbled Himself more than any other to serve us. And this is what He calls us to do uh, through the Apostle Paul in our passage. Have this attitude in yourselves that was also in Christ Jesus. Now this evening what I'd like for us to do is to consider some of the motives that Paul actually gives us here. Things that will encourage us and help us. Things we should find within ourselves uh, that will give us the strength to do what he calls us to do. I want us to look secondly at some of the things that Paul actually tells us to do that we, that we should do in following Christ's example. And then thirdly, I want us to understand that there is a reward that he holds out in front of us. It's basically similar to that which the Father holds out to his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're willing to do this, then I will exalt you. And as Jesus already told us, if we will humble ourselves be the servant of all. We will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So how can we reflect this same attitude that was in Jesus Christ? Where are we going to find the motives to do this and what should be our motivation? I think Paul gives us four things and I believe they're all found in verse 1. Encouragement in Christ, consolation of love, fellowship of the Spirit, and affection and compassion. You know, the funny thing is, I'm, having read uh, Jonathan Edwards' Religious Affections, when I look at these things, I realize all these things can be summarized by one motive, and that is love. Because all of these things either engender love or produce love or are love, and these are to be our motives. Now, Paul uh, indicates through the particular way that he writes this in, in the Greek language that uh, these things already exist in the hearts of the Philippian jailer. You know, if you read this, you almost suspect that he's saying, well, if this is true, then you should do this. If this is true, you should do this. But in the Greek, the way that he writes it indicates that these things are true. He's not you know, questioning whether it's true or not, or if you happen to find these things, this is what you should do. But he's saying these things are in your hearts. And this is where you're going to find the motivation you need to do it. These things are in our hearts too. If we have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ and have His Spirit living in us. So let's consider these, these motives briefly. 
First of all, if we are believers, we should find within our own lives and our own hearts encouragement in Christ. And I think it means basically what it, what it says, that the desire will be in our hearts already to do what the Lord calls us to do based upon what Jesus Christ has done for us. Encouragement in Christ. I think in Christ's example and also, of course, in those uh, blessings that are actually ours in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we've already looked at his example. I mean, what is it that Jesus Christ has done for you that should encourage you to do what Paul says you should do for him? Well, again, he was God and was willing to make this infinite stoop to take upon himself your nature, to be, take our nature, to become a man to, to save us. He took upon himself the obligation to obey the law. I mean, the lawmaker becomes one of the subjects of his own law, and the Lord obeyed it. He took, as we've already seen, your obligation in God's uh, court to pay for your crimes, and he paid it. And he did this out of a heart of infinite love for you. Now, because he's done that, the Lord has also opened the doors of heaven. He's also given to you an, an inheritance which is undefiled, imperishable, will not pass away, not like the things of this world. Uh, he has um, given you this inheritance in the new heavens and the new earth where you will actually, whether in heaven between now and the time when Jesus comes again or in the new heavens and the new earth, you will be filled with the Spirit of God, immersed in a world of love. Now, Think about all of those things and, are can, well, do those things basically give you encouragement uh, to do what the Lord calls you to do? Those are so many motives that, that move us uh, to become more like Him, to have that attitude that Jesus Christ had, the attitude of servant. Second, He says there will be the consolation of love, or in other words, the motives or incentives that uh, love gives us. When you think about what Jesus Christ has done for you, what is it that it creates in your heart? Well, if, if you're looking at it correctly and you, you love the Lord because of the work of the Spirit of, of God in your heart, what it will do is it will cause you to love Him. Uh, you should always experience, you know, love whenever somebody shows you some extraordinary kindness. And I believe the Lord has certainly done that in what we have seen already. Now, this love of gratitude will move us to do whatever the Lord calls us to do. It's, um, it's kind of like if, if somebody came up to you and, and gave you a check for $10 million and it was authentic and you knew it was real, uh, your heart would, would certainly, uh, I think, be uh, uh, full of gratitude towards that individual. And if he, he should ask you for some uh, small favor that doesn't require anything that would be sinful, I think you'd be more than willing to do it for him. Well, how much more when the Lord forgives us an infinite debt at such a high price uh, should we be moved to gratitude to do what it is He calls us to do? So here's our second motive is, is this love of gratitude that we have for the Lord. Uh, Paul says there's even more than that. There is the fellowship of the Spirit, which he says will be in us. And as you know, the Spirit of God dwells in every believer. This is this fellowship of the Spirit is basically the communion that we have with the Spirit of God as He dwells within us and works His nature within us to make us more like the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the thing that the Spirit of God does is really produce love. I told you all these things could be resolved into love. But He is the Spirit of love. He is uh, the love of God, as it were. The fruit the Spirit produces is love, and that love changes us from the inside out to make us more like our Lord Jesus Christ, to give us His same love, that we would desire the same things, the glory of His Father, uh, to serve others who are in need. He gave us that in order that we might do this. Now, remember that what, what love does, now this, this isn't just a love of gratitude, but this is a love that actually loves uh, the object, that finds delight and pleasure in a particular object, and that object, of course, would be uh, God. 
and our Lord Jesus Christ. What, what does love move you to do when you have that kind of love for someone? Well, it moves you to please that person, to do whatever you can to, to serve that one which is the object of your love. What, whatever has control of our hearts, whatever we are in love with, will control our lives. And that's, of course, why the Lord tells us we need to guard our hearts to make sure that we do not love things that will lead us away from Jesus, but rather to love those things that will draw us uh, to Him, to love Him. We need to do uh, whatever we can to strengthen this love for the Lord because if you love Him, if you have this love of the Spirit and you nurture that love and make it stronger, you will do everything in your power to please Him. In other words, you'll want to be more like Jesus Christ. You'll want to adopt His attitude, His character, and you will humble yourself to become a servant, even as He did. And then fourthly, He says that you will have affection and compassion. And I think by this, Paul means a, a deep-seated love, that affection for one another, and a, and a heart that is touched by the sufferings of others, compassion. We don't need compassion when it comes to the Lord because He's perfectly blessed. So what Paul has in mind here is the love that we should have for one another, the sympathy, the pity, the mercy that we should have for others, even as Jesus was moved by such uh, you know, compassion and mercy toward others, uh, to reach out to them, to minister to them, to do what He could to relieve their suffering, but especially to preach the gospel uh, to them. So again, these, these are the motives that the Lord has given to us, the things He has put in our hearts that will move us to do what the Lord calls us to do. Now, if you are actually to do that and to do it with, with success, with, um, you know, say something more than just a uh, slight uh, desire to do it, you need to nurture these particular motives in your heart because to the degree that you do, to that degree, you'll find yourself with that attitude that was in the Lord Jesus Christ. So what can we do? Thinking about these particular motives that Paul gives to us and the things that should be in our hearts, what can we, how can we improve these things? How can we uh, gain more from them so that we will desire to do more what he calls us to do here? Well, think about the encouragements of our Lord Jesus Christ or encouragement in Christ. How can we draw more encouragement from that, from what He has done. Well, I think um, one of the things we can do is read the devotionals that uh, Greg has been writing as we meditate on 52 reasons why we should celebrate the Lord's Supper because every single one of them has to do with what Jesus Christ did for us. And the more you meditate on His, on his death, what it means, the sacrifice, the love behind it, what it calls us to do, the more you're going to be encouraged to, to do what the Lord calls you to do. And of course, the more you think about the Lord Jesus Christ and what He has done, the more it's going to uh, draw out of your heart a, a, a gratitude to lay down your life for Him, even as He laid down His life for you. I mean, that is a tremendous sacrifice that the Lord has made. You need to nurture the work of the Spirit of God in your heart, that fellowship of the Spirit. That's not something that just happens automatically. Because you're a Christian, you have the Spirit, but as Paul tells us in, in, well, Ephesians, you need to be filled with the Spirit of God, filled with the Spirit, which means we're not automatically full. There are things that we have to do, and what we have to do is we have to be in the means of grace. We have to use them. God has given us His Word. We need to read it. We need to read it in faith. We need to receive what it says, and we need to be in it on a daily basis. If we're not in the Word of God, we're not going to have the strength we need to do what the Lord calls us to do. I mean, it's been likened to daily bread, and it is bread, spiritual bread, and we need to eat it. We need to pray also. The Lord tells us pray without ceasing. The, the Lord Jesus Christ gives us an example of a life of prayer. We need to devote ourselves to prayer. And I'll tell you one thing, I, I've discovered that sometimes when we have a hard time focusing on seeking the Lord by ourselves and, and praying alone. It's much easier when you're with somebody else, isn't it? 
for one thing, uh, you know, it's, uh, you have the, the concern or the awareness of what the other person might, might think of you, and it kind of helps sharpen you, you know, and, and you marshal your, your energies a little bit better, and you, uh, you pray more earnestly. But there's another benefit, I think, when we get together and pray. The Lord has told us several times in Scripture that when we actually uh, agree on something with another believer and we pray together corporately, that uh, he seems to be more apt to hear us. And I found that to be the case. When you get together with someone and pray for something specifically, the Lord seems to answer those prayers much more powerfully, much more openly so you can see it, uh, sometimes in ways that we don't see when we pray individually. I'm not saying that God won't answer prayers when we pray individually, but I'm just saying that we need to pray by ourselves. We need to pray with other believers. We need to meet with the people of God when they're praying, but we need to be in prayer it will strengthen the work of the Spirit of God in our hearts. We need to be faithful in attending worship. Here we have the opportunity to worship the Lord twice on the Lord's Day. And, of course, we have the midweek meeting, which is a study in the Word of God, as well as a time of prayer. And that's a means by which we will grow spiritually stronger if we are participating in that and worshiping the Lord and immersing ourselves in His Word and taking those truths and applying them and seeking the Lord in prayer. We need to participate regularly in the Lord's Supper because it too is a means of grace. And one thing that I'm sure what we, we often think about but we need to realize is a means that the Lord uses to nurture that work of His Spirit in our hearts as well is the fellowship that we can have with other members of the body of Christ, and especially those who are strong in the faith. If we spend time with those who are godly, it will make us more godly. If we spend time with people who are ungodly, and I'm not saying ungodly believers, but the people of the world, then it's going to make us more ungodly. Paul tells us, don't be deceived, bad company corrupts good morals. So if we are to be strong in the Lord, we need to have close fellowship with those who love Him. Again, David, when he was king, made sure that the people who were around him, the people who ministered to him, were godly people, and they wouldn't be the kind of people who would lead him away from the Lord, but rather strengthen his resolve to serve Him. So that is what we need to do to nurture the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and, of course, with regard to affection and compassion for the, our brothers and sisters in Christ, I think the only way to strengthen that is by exercising it, by loving one another, by entering into the concerns and cares of one another and doing what we can to either alleviate their suffering or to strengthen them in some way. You know, we can never give more in the kingdom of heaven than we will receive from the Lord. As we give love, as we show mercy, pity, sympathy, compassion to brothers and sisters in the Lord, we'll find more coming back towards us than we're giving out. The Lord will grant us that blessing. So these are the motives. These are the things that the Lord tells us that we really need to have an operation in our hearts. If we are believers, they will be in operation in our hearts. We need to nurture them so that they become stronger. And the stronger they become, the easier it's going to be to do what Paul, in essence, tells us to do, which is to have this attitude which was in Christ Jesus. Now, I, believe, I do believe the second part here, as we move into the second point, Paul is expressing uh, various ways in which we can uh, express this attitude which was in our Lord Jesus Christ, different ways in which we can serve and help one another. And let me just say at the outset that, um, again, we really need to be strong in the virtues that we've just looked at if we're going to be able to do what Paul exhorts us to do here. Because what he tells us to do is, well, basically go against our flesh. If we were to take the things that Paul tells us that we should do and we were to negate them, you know, sort of you know, express what the opposite of each one of these things are, we, we find that it's a very good description of the flesh and what it is that we as believers are to be fighting against. I think sometimes I've seen those who profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ almost to look at the, the opposite of these things as virtues that they should be doing rather than the things that we're actually 
called to do. I think it wouldn't be bad just simply to look at them at this way initially, to approach them just, just to have a sharp contrast with what it is the Lord calls us to do. And by the way, we should also bear in mind that even though we are believers and we have God's Spirit working in our hearts, it doesn't mean that we're not going to have some of these negative things or all of these negative things working in our hearts as well because we still have sin and corruption in us and it's going to be with us as long as we are in this world. When we die, that's when we finally get to be rid of our sin once and for all. That's one reason, by the way, we should look forward to death is because then the Lord will take us up into heaven, then we will be perfect, then we will love as we always hoped we would love and we'll stop doing the things that we have hated. So if we negate these things, what, what do we end up with? Well, we'd end up with a contrary mind and disposition toward others, especially against the Lord and against His people. Uh, we would end up not loving even hating other people, even, well, especially our brothers and sisters, or favoring some, loving some, and not loving others, showing favoritism. We would end up being divisive, having our own agenda, seeking to further that rather than furthering God's agenda. We would be selfish, wanting our way in everything. We'd be conceited, thinking that we're better than everyone else and more gifted and more important, of course. And we would be looking out for just our interests, what is best for us, and we'd be entirely unconcerned for those around us. Now, remember, this is the opposite of what the Lord calls us to do. These are the things we should put to death. And one of the best ways to put these things to death is by putting on the opposite virtue. Remember, Paul says to the thief, steal no longer, but rather work so that you may have something to give to those who are in need. Well, understanding how, how ugly these opposite things are, we should not only see the beauty of what it is that God calls us to do, but we should seek to do those things because in doing those things, we will weaken the things we don't want going on in our lives. So what is it that Paul calls us to do based upon the things we've already seen? First of all, he says, as much as possible, be of the same mind with one another. Think the same thing, uh, believe the same truths, see the Bible the same way, submit to the same commands. Um, again, the more we can be of the same mind, the better we're going to get along together. The Lord is telling us here that we need to agree. Now, granted, there are times when we do have to disagree with even a brother or sister in the Lord because in our estimation they believe something contrary to God's truth. I don't think Paul is saying you have to absolutely believe everything the same, but I think what he's warning us against here is the tendency we sometimes find in our hearts to disagree just because in our flesh we tend to be disagreeable. I mean, have you ever been in a situation like that where you, you know that what your brother or sister is saying is true? but you're so worked up in the flesh that you feel like you just have to disagree. Sometimes we call it being the devil's advocate, but um, sometimes when we do that, we're not doing what we should be doing. We need to be agreeing and not disagreeing. If you find yourself being the devil's advocate, as it were, uh, too much, you better examine your heart on that matter and see if you have a disagreeable spirit. The Lord says He wants us to be of the same mind. Secondly, we are to maintain the same love which means we are to love each other and care for each other. And we're to be careful that we maintain that love uh, for each other, to keep it alive and not let it die. I mean, if you've been in the church long enough, uh, you know as well as I do that um, there are those cases where you have brothers and sisters that you, that you love, they're very dear to you. And something happens that um, causes some kind of a rift or division, and that division gets stronger and stronger and wider and wider until finally uh, you're not even talking to one another and don't even want to see each other. Sadly, that happens. But as much as it depends upon us, we must not 
let that happen. We should do everything we can to prevent that from happening. Let me just mention one thing Peter tells us to do is to be strong in our love, fervent in our love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of minor offenses. It, it overlooks things. It doesn't exact justice in every single case uh, demanding that a person ask forgiveness for every small infraction. Although if we are, of course, guilty of, of having offended someone or sinning against someone, we should ask for their forgiveness, but we shouldn't always insist that they ask for ours. We need to over, overlook certain things, cover over them in love. If we can't do this, it's very unlikely that we're ever going to be able to do what Paul calls us to do here, to maintain this love for all the brethren in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to be willing to overlook and forgive. And in cases where we can't, then we need to be willing to go to that person and to seek to, to bring that offense to them, to bring them to repentance. If we can't cover it over, then we need to deal with it uh, in a biblical way. Paul says, thirdly, that we are to be united in spirit. We are to be harmonious in soul. As A.T. Robertson, the uh, Greek scholar, puts it, we need to have souls that beat together <laughs> in tune with Christ and with each other so that we will be able to work well together. We need to be united in spirit, particularly, he says, fourthly, we need to be intent on one purpose. We need to have a common goal that's going to keep us all moving the same way. And that goal, of course, is not going to be our own personal agenda, but it's going to be what the Lord Jesus Christ has called us to do as His church. If we you know, engage in that, focus on that, it's going to be more than we're going to be able to complete in our lives. It's enough. And we need to have His goal as our goal. And fifthly, he says, we are not to do what we do thinking only of ourselves or seeking to gain attention and notoriety for ourselves but rather we are to humble ourselves. And rather than thinking that we're so much better than others, we are to think that others are better than we are. You know, that's the one area in all of, of the Christian life where the Lord gives us the go-ahead to try to outdo one another, and that is in showing honor to one another. We're not to exalt ourselves over one another and trump one another with, with our accomplishments or our gifts, boast about what we've done, try to one-up everyone, but rather we are to try to, to give each other more honor than we would try to gain, as it were, for ourselves. That is the one area where the Lord gives us, again, the, uh, the go-ahead to try to outdo it. Actually, maybe there's two. The other one is to try to outdo one another and serving one another and perhaps those are the same things. So rather than being conceited, rather than being selfish, we are to humble ourselves and we are to seek what is good for others. We are to care for others, not just to be concerned for ourselves or even just the needs of our own household, but the needs and the interests of others to share in each other's lives, to care about what happens to our brothers and sisters to minister to them, to help them. Again, think about what our Lord Jesus Christ did, being God, infinitely blessed and in need of nothing, uh, descended by taking our nature upon Himself and becoming a servant to us to relieve us of our misery because of His mercy, because of His pity, because of His great love. Well, that's what the Lord calls us to do. Don't just think about your own needs. Don't be concerned just for yourself, but be concerned for one another. If we do this, then we will have the attitude which was in our Lord Jesus Christ. We will be like Him. When He was thinking about His own comfort levels as a man in the garden, thinking about what was ahead of Him, He prayed, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass for me. But then being the servant that He was, He says, nevertheless, not my will, but Your will be done putting the needs, of course, what his father has called him to do, the needs of his people. If he didn't go through with this because this was the only way, they wouldn't be saved. They would all suffer and be destroyed in hell. All of us would have been destroyed in hell. But Jesus, again, looking at our need and having compassion on us, said, not my will, not my self-preservation, not my comfort, 
but your will be done. I will drink this cup. I will drink down its dregs. I will go through this furnace of fire for you and for my people to save them. So he was willing to do this for his father, and he was willing to do this for us. As Jesus said on another occasion, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now again, this is what his sacrifice, this is what his servanthood, this is what his example calls us to do. Again, I, I know we've looked at a number of things, but again, basically the first one is the love of God to move us to become more like Jesus Christ, to become a servant to one another. If we're not serving, if we don't have this mind of Christ, if we don't have this attitude of Christ, if that's not what we're doing, then we're really not fulfilling what it is that God actually saved us for because He saved us that we might be servants, that we might be like Jesus Christ, and that's exactly what He was. So the Lord gives us one more incentive to help us to move in this direction. You know, He's given us the example of Christ. There's lots of things to draw from that. Draws out our heart and gratitude to Him. He's given us His Holy Spirit to produce this love within our souls. Um, and also, of course, you know, love not just for the Lord, but also for the people of God. Um, and He's given us, of course, the example, as I've said, of our Lord Jesus Christ. But He also holds out for us a promise that if we are willing to humble ourselves as Jesus Christ humbled Himself and serve one another, that the Lord will exalt us in the same way that He exalted the Lord Jesus Christ, although not to that degree because He is the one who humbled Himself much more than we could ever possibly humble ourselves. God became man and went into the depths as it were, even into hell on the cross suffered His Father's wrath in order to save us. We can't come anywhere near to that, and so we're not going to come anywhere near to that exaltation that He had, and yet the Lord tells us the one who humbles Himself the most, to be the servant, to become the servant of all, that is the one who will be the greatest in His kingdom. So this is what the Lord promises us if we will do this. He will grant to us that position. By the way, I should mention there are other blessings as well that we can receive if we do this. If, if you humble yourself and serve others, you'll find that your, your own um, spirituality will grow. It's almost, you might say, like a means of grace. It's submitting to God's commandments and doing what He calls you to do. That will strengthen you spiritually. And as you are strengthened spiritually, you'll also find a stronger assurance that you really are the Lord's. Sometimes we struggle knowing whether we're Christians or not, but if we do what the Lord calls us to do and we see Christ-like graces at work in our lives, it, it really does strengthen our assurance that we really are His. The Lord says there will be blessings in this life besides a stronger assurance. Remember in Acts 20, 35, the Lord told Paul, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Sometimes we turn that around and we think it's more blessed actually to receive. The one who gets more gifts and the one who gets more things from this world is the one who wins, but we know that isn't true. The true blessing is when we give to others. And when you've given yourself to doing that, giving and serving and caring and showing compassion, you find that it's true. You do have more coming back by way of spiritual blessing, God's presence in your heart, and even perhaps material things that the Lord might be pleased to give to you. He does tell us, for instance, if we are faithful in our giving to Him, that He will be faithful to bless everything that we have. He'll open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing greater than anything we can contain. So there are blessings in this life, stronger assurance, and also the, uh, well, the, the blessings God might give to us for, for doing this. But there will also be rewards in heaven. The more you are like Jesus Christ in this world... Uh, we might say the closer you're going to be seated to Him above. Now, whether there's literal seats in heaven, whether there's a table we're going to sit down to, whether there's somehow a spatial relationship as to how far away we are from Jesus, we really don't know. But we do know that the Lord promises to reward what we do. And Jesus already told us uh, through His rebuke of His disciples who were arguing which among us is going to be the greatest in God's kingdom, that 
there are differing levels of reward and different places of, of privilege in heaven. There's, there's going to be one who's going to sit on Jesus' right and left. Uh, I would say that would be a seat of honor. Uh, the one who humbles himself to become the servant of all is the one who will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. If there's a greatest, there must be those that are less great, right? Differing degrees of reward. So there are rewards in heaven to encourage us to become like our Lord Jesus Christ, to love the Father enough, to love Jesus enough, to love others enough, to humble ourselves, to do for others what Jesus Christ has done for us. So let's, by His grace, stir up that love in our hearts and use the means of grace to gain more of His Spirit. And then let's serve the Lord as faithfully as we possibly can here by serving and caring for others as much as we care for ourselves. Jesus says, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. May the Lord give us the grace to do this. Let, let's bow in a moment of prayer and ask that the Lord might take His Word and apply it to our lives.